Church, where we are gathering today, the last Sunday of Pentecost, the last Sunday of the liturgical year, and also a time which we gather with thanksgiving, for we recognize God as the giver of all these many good gifts, and we give our thanks and praise back to the God who blesses us. Today in our worship service, and every Sunday, it is our tradition to gather around the table of the Lord. So if you're watching us from home, you might want to pause the video at this point, gather your communion elements, and maybe light a candle along with us so you can participate fully in the worship life of the church. But we're so glad that you're able to worship with us, whether here in our beautiful historic sanctuary or from far off places. We welcome you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let us worship today with the prelude.
let's join together in the invocation. Holy Spirit, bless us with your presence in our culture today. Inspire us to new ways of thinking and better ways of reflecting your love. Bring us confidence that God's light guides us in the darkness. Help us to emerge with hope and love as living testimonies of the joy that comes with the harvest. Amen. We give thanks to the God who is so good, for we know your steadfast love endures forever. Let us all give thanks for God's steadfast love, for God's wonderful works to humankind. We know God satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. And so now, God, let us take a time to center ourselves to praise you. Let all people who know you praise you. We thank you for this beautiful earth that has yielded its produce. We thank you for all living creatures. We give thanks to God, creator of heaven and earth, whose faithful love endures forever. And while we are aware that God, our Heavenly Parent, has lavished so many good gifts upon us, including abundant life, we confess that sometimes we have used the gifts carelessly. We have acted as though we are not grateful. We have enjoyed the fruits of the harvest, but we forgot that they came from you, that you gave them to us in mercy. And so forgive us, God, and help us. Help us, when we are full and satisfied, to not ignore the cry of the hungry and those in need, when we are thoughtless and do not treat or respect one another with care. Remind us of the wonderful world that you made and all the ways that you have loved us and blessed us. Lead us to greater mercy for all humankind in your Son's name. And now, God, we uplift all those who are in need of your healing power, those who are hospitalized, 
our homebound, those who are rehabilitating. We ask that you strengthen them and comfort them in long days ahead. We pray for those who are grieving, who are anxious, who carry many burdens, God. Provide them a measure of relief and give them the joy and the presence of your spirit upon them, knowing that despite what they go through, they are never alone. God, we pray for our community, for our schools, which have necessarily had to close because of COVID transmissions. We pray, God, that you'll help us act with wisdom and good sense that we might protect the most vulnerable around us. Help us, God, be safe among our brothers and sisters. Help us spread the news of the vaccine that is available. And may others be led to receive it so that one day we can hopefully emerge from this crisis and give us a sense of hope along the way. Guide and protect your children, O oh God. As we enter into this season of Thanksgiving, help us always turn our hearts to you, mindful that you are the one who created us, who blessed us, who calls all creation good. Grant us thankful hearts, as well as a loving concern for all people and for your earth. We pray this through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is Isaiah 9th chapter, verses 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the later time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond Jordan, Galilee, of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken, as on the day of Midian, for all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time onward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. A word from the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Seasonal affective disorder affects nearly 3 million people. It typically occurs in the fall and winter months when the days are short and the nights are long. Throw in the time change in early November, and for those of us living in the Eastern time zone, we have very short days. For today, Sunday, November 21st, 2021, there are only nine hours and 55 minutes of daylight. And the days will continue to grow shorter and the darkness will increase until the winter solstice, or what's called the longest night, on Tuesday, December 21st. Millions of people affected by fall and winter onset of SAD, as it's called, seasonal affective disorder. They can have symptoms of depression, low energy, moodiness, increased appetite for starchy foods, and even weight gain during the winter months. Medical interventions are available, however, and one thing that is highly effective is simply exposure to light. You can even buy a light box to have in your house that can replicate the glow of the sun to help you with those, those symptoms. We experience a lot of darkness during these months. And I wonder what kind of darkness the people of Israel were experiencing to cause the prophet Isaiah to prophesy the text that we just heard today. Many believe that he was responding to the military invasion of the northern kingdom. The Assyrians had laid siege to Israel, and Judah was receiving many of the refugees, and they were living in fear that they would be attacked next. He told them in the previous chapter that the Lord is hiding his face from Judah. Some are faithless, and they want to consult ghosts and spirits rather than rely upon their one true God. If this happens, Isaiah tells them, there will be no dawn for them. They will only see distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. <coughs> that sounds like a really hopeless experience. But God does not leave them there. God sends them the king Hezekiah, who will lead the people in great strength. He will keep their borders safe. Isaiah elevates him to nearly divine status, seeing as him the one chosen by God to carry on the lineage of King David. Now, many of the prophets are very suspicious and critical of the monarchy, but Isaiah of Jerusalem uplifts Hezekiah as a form of salvation for the people. And you can hear in this chapter the reversal of their circumstances. Their nation will multiply. On them a light will shine. They will have joy at the harvest. And the yoke that weighs across their shoulders will be removed. When he says that a child is born and authority rests upon his shoulders, Isaiah is not yet referencing Jesus of Nazareth, though the birth of Jesus will occur some 700 years later. He's probably referring to Hezekiah. It was widespread in the Near East to refer to kings as sons of God, as divine beings, and this is part of his coronation anthem. It's an ode to this earthly king. But the people can perceive it as salvific because they need to be saved politically and militarily. Spiritual salvation would be no good for them if they were only to live oppressed by the swords of their enemies. So Isaiah helps them see their present help in human form exists because of their faithfulness to God. It will only be later that people will hear of the child being born in a manger and they will recall these verses from Isaiah and they will feel like this prophecy had far-reaching implications beyond just its local, social, and historical setting. Stephen and I are big history buffs and we've been enjoying watching this documentary on Netflix about World War II. As we see the footage of these horrible atrocities that were committed during that time, 
it just startles our senses all over again. We see the Jews being led away in train cars that were taking them to concentration camps. We see the horrendous attack on Pearl Harbor, the long winter in Russia where many died and froze and starved to death. We see the Allies' destruction of the city of Dresden that was a targeted civilian attack. And then, of course, we will witness the use of atomic bombs to effectively end the war. It is frightening to think how willing humans are to destroy one another. There is no denying that evil forces were at work in the world that threatened the well-being, perhaps, of the entire human race. And I wonder what it was like for those of you who had to live through those scary times. But I also wonder what it was like for those Europeans who were under siege from the Nazis. Those who had to turn off their lights and huddle in the dark to try to not be a target of the Blitzkrieg. I can't imagine how terrifying it must have been to huddle there, especially with little children trying to comfort them. Or what it might have been for the Jews who tried to hide in attics and under floorboards to go unnoticed when the Nazis and their dogs would pass by a house. Fortunately, the U.S. entered the war and helped change the tide of it. The Allied forces slowly began to liberate cities from the hold of the Nazis. They showed up at camps to release those who had not already perished. They were welcomed as heroes in some of the larger cities. By the presence of these humans who helped defeat evil, the people felt like they were seeing a great light. And on them, the light was shining. They could come out from hiding and begin the rebuilding process in safety and with hope. They must have felt like the people of Jerusalem, those who had walked in darkness, had finally seen some light. What is the most significant sign of hope for a society? Time and time again, when people feel safe, when they have all their basic needs met, when they don't feel threatened by outside forces, the greatest sign of hope we have is an increase in the birth rate. Think about it. The American economy after World War II was strong. Jobs were plentiful. Infrastructure was being built all over our nation. Schools, hospitals, and churches were going up at a rapid rate. One could afford education, a home, and a car. That was in reach for most people. And they felt like they could support larger families. Approximately 4.2 million babies were born each year between 1946 and 1964, comprising 40% of the current U.S. population. I see you out there, those of you of the baby boom generation, and I'm grateful for you. A society does not reproduce at that rate unless they feel like the children they are bringing into the <coughs> world can have a hopeful future. I don't think it would be too far a stretch to say that we, during the year 2020 and 2021, have experienced some darkness. The past two years of the pandemic have stretched us thin. They have created many opportunities for us to grieve. We lament the state of health care, the overwhelming loss of life, and quite simply, the negative impacts it's had on our workplaces and our lifestyles. It might make us wonder, oh God, will we ever emerge? I find myself asking, when will the next variant reveal itself and where and how fast will it spread? Our county is experiencing its highest transmission level since this all started just as we were beginning to feel a little safe and hopeful. 
and remind us that our Bible moves in grand sweeps from darkness to light. We remember in the beginning the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And God spoke and God created light. God gives us a greater light by day and a lesser light by night. God led the Israelites through the wilderness with smoke during the day, but a flame at night. And then, of course, Jesus comes as the light of the world. And at Pentecost, the church formed by hearing the message that was given by those apostles as the flames appeared above their heads and people could understand one another even though they spoke different languages. We know ultimately that we are led increasingly from darkness to light. But we also know that as we live our lives from day to day, darkness can be intermingled with the light. This happened in real time this past week as Circle 4 met at Sally Daly's house. One member of the church was celebrating the beautiful gift of new life of a very wanted and loved and sought after baby, while another member received news of a grave situation affecting her family. And there we were together as the church experiencing light and dark, despair and hope, life and death. In the mystery of life, it is all intermingled. We experience it at the same time, and none of us get to avoid the darkness. I want us to hear the words of Isaiah speaking to us today. We might find hope in certain human leaders they can shed light on these dark situations, and some might be able to lead us to a brighter future. But as the church, we do not ultimately place our hope in human leaders. Like the Israelites, we must consistently place our hope in God. Now God might send us some very effective leaders, but we need to recognize that they come ordained from God. We end the liturgical year today, and next Sunday begins the new year, the season of Advent, one in which we prepare for the birth of a child. This child is a human one who can truly save us. So if you are experiencing darkness, or if you are sad, or if you have seasonal affective disorder, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. God is with us, and God is in every situation, and the light of Christ still shines. I bid you to also remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He tells us not to hide the lamp under a bushel, no, but let it shine, to place it on the lampstand so that all can see it. And we are told to let our light shine so that people can see our good works and praise God because they see that light reflected from us. In the sermon in Matthew, he doesn't say, I am the light of the world. I want you to notice. He says to his followers, you are the light of the world. You are the light. I feel our role as Christians and as a church is to continually reflect that light into these dark places. We all know people who are stumbling around in the dark trying to find their way. I hope that when we leave this place and we encounter those people who are lost in the dark, that they will see our little light, and we'll see it shining, we might be able to lead them in the right direction. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Show me your little light. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Shine. Don't let Satan in 
it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm gonna let it shine. More convincing. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. You are the light of the world. So let's go forth from this place, believing that and showing just our little light. That's all it takes to dispel the darkness. It's just one little light. And let's show it to the entire world. Amen. And now we come before the table of the Lord. We don't come here because we are worthy. We come here knowing that God makes us worthy. And wants to give us hospitality of the meal. Of bread broken that reminds us of Christ's body. And wine outpoured to remind us of his blood. And as we consider what he went through for us, we draw closer to his love, and we want to share it with others. Let us dine at the table of the Lord and experience this great feast.
breath we must take in such a troubled time. We know you bless us beyond our shortcomings, and we are grateful. We know you forgive us when we are lax in giving thanks, and we know that we are given in great measure, even when we fail in so many ways. For all we give thanks, we ask blessings on those who suffer, the hungry, the lonely, the sick, the bereaved, the mentally ill, the homeless. May they find comfort and their needs fulfilled. In Christ's holy name, amen.
and when he had given thanks, and he said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper also, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Once again, welcome to worship. I'm glad that you were able to worship with us in whatever setting you find yourself. I remind you, if you are with us in person, to fill out your welcome card so that we can have a record of your visit with us. And you can communicate anything to the office that you might need. Um, if you have an additional prayer request or, or any, any other request to the office, you can fill that out on the back. But while you're on the back side of your car, go ahead and list something you give thanks to God for. Especially in this season of Thanksgiving, we can look around with glad and generous hearts and recognize all the many blessings that we have received. And we will place that alongside our offerings today. If you are able to support the special Thanksgiving offering, I know disciples, especially those in higher education, would be appreciative. From the very beginning of our movement, we have been committed to education, and of that I know I am proud. It's important not only to have educated people occupying the pulpits, perhaps most importantly, is to have them occupy the pews. And that's what disciples have been committed to for all of these years. We have a scriptural mandate to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of our minds so that we can discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. I am proud that we have a tradition that supports higher education critical thinking, and, and good, well-read people. That is not a challenge to our faith. It is what supports our faith. So please give as you are able. Thank you.
and gracious God, we lift our hearts with praise and thanksgiving, honoring you as the one who blesses us. We thank you for all these opportunities to give today, and we ask God that you will bless these gifts, multiply them in the name of your Son, and guide us for their best use in this world. We pray over the backpack food, the wonderful children and families who will receive it, the wonderful hands who collect it and pack it and distribute it. We thank you for the gifts to the church so that we can be like a city on a hill and shine your light so that others might see it. And we thank you for the gifts for higher education. We pray that we will not cease renewing our minds so that we can discern your will. Amen. 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 Your invitation to discipleship, although it might not be your day to come forward and confess Jesus as Lord and join our church, for many of you have already done that, that doesn't quite get you off the hook from your call to discipleship. Today, I hope you heard in the words from Isaiah the power that light can have in the darkness. And I want you to go forth after these young men extinguish the light, notice that they carry it out. And I want you to do the same exact thing. Let us sing our hymn of departing, Let All Things Now Living. Amen. 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 Amen.